My name is Sam Bakunin and I'm a columnist in Brussels Morning. The world of finance, both domestic and international, is infested with narcissists and psychopaths. They are overrepresented. In Fortune 500 companies, there are many studies, Hare, Babyak and others, but they are also overrepresented, especially the narcissists, in the finance industry because finance is power, finance is access, finance is attention, and all these appeal to the narcissists, especially malignant narcissists, and they gravitate into these positions. Many of them become the equivalents of con artists and swindlers in suits. And this is the topic of today's video. Strange penumbral characters roam the boardrooms of banks the world over. Some of them pop apparently from nowhere. Others are well connected and equipped with the most excellent introductions. They all peddle financial transactions, which are too good to be true and often are. In the unctuously perfumed propinquity of their Mercedes Rolex waving entourage, the polydipsic natives dissolve in their irresistible charm and the temptations of the cash. Mountainous returns on capital, effulgent profits, no collaterals, track record or business plan required, get rich quick schemes, total security is cloyingly assured. These Fausts roughly belong to four tribes. The first one is the shoppers. These are the shabby operators of the marginal, on the marginal shadows of the world of finance. They broker financial deals with meretricious sweat, only to be rewarded their meager, humiliated fees. Most of their deals do not materialize. The principle is very simple. They approach a bank, a financial institution, or a borrower, and they say, we are connected to banks or financial institutions in the West. We can bring you money in the form of credits. But to do that, you must first express interest in getting this money. You must furnish us with a bank guarantee, a, pro a promissory note, letter of intent that indicates that you desire the credit and that you are willing to provide a liquid financial instrument to back it up. Having obtained the aforementioned instruments, the shoppers begin to shop around. They approach banks and financial institutions, usually in the West, but not only. And this time, they reverse the text. They say, we have an excellent client, a good borrower. Are you willing to lend to it? An informal process of tendering, auctioning ensues. Sometimes it ends in a transaction and the shopper collects a small commission between one a um, quarter of a percentage point and two percentage points, depending on the amount, kind of finder's fee. But mostly, in most cases, the process does not end in a transaction, and the Flying Dutchman resumes his or her wanderings, usually his, by the way, majority of men, looking for more venal dulosity and less legal probity. The shoppers. The second group are the con men, or the con artists, or the swindlers, or the scammers. These are crooks who set up elaborate schemes, sting operations, in order to extract money from unsuspecting people and from financial institutions. They establish fronts or phantom firms and offices, shell firms, throughout the world. They tempt the gullible by offering them enormous, immediate, tax-free, effort-free profits. They let the victims profit in the first round or two of the scam, and then the hammer. And then they sting. The victims invest money, and it evaporates together with the dishonest operators. The offices are deserted. The fake identities, the forged bank references, the falsified guarantees are all exposed, often with the help of an inside informant, a whistleblower, or the authorities. But of course it's too late. 
Probably the most famous and enduring scam is the Nigerian kind of uh, connection. Letters allegedly composed by very influential and highly placed officials are sent out to unsuspecting businessmen. The latter are asked to make their bank accounts available to the former, who profess to need the third party bank accounts through which to funnel the sweet fruits of corruption. The account owners are promised huge financial rewards if they collaborate and if they bear some minor, uh, by comparison, upfront fees, upfront costs. The conmen pocket these so called expenses or charges and they vanish. Sometimes they even empty the accounts uh, of their entire balance as they evaporate. These are classical criminals, con artists. The third group are the money launderers. A lot of cash goes undeclared to tax authorities in developing countries. The informal grey economy, the daughter of both criminal and legitimate parents, comprises between 15%, for example, in Slovenia, and 50%, 50% in Russia, of the official economy. Some say that these figures are deliberate and ferocious understatements. Anyhow, these are mind-boggling amounts, which circulate between financial centers and offshore havens in the world. Places like Cyprus, used to be Lebanon, Cayman Islands, Liechtenstein, Vaduz, Panama, and dozens of other aspiring laundrettes. The money thus smuggled is kept in low-yielding cash deposits. To escape the cruel fate of inflationary corrosion, it has to be reinvested. It is stealthily reintroduced into the very economy that it had sought to evade in the form of investment capital or other financial assets, loans, credits, and so on. The anxious owners of this capital are preoccupied with legitimizing their stillborn cash through the conduit of tax-fearing enterprises or with lending it to someone. The emphasis is on the word legitimate. The money surges in through mysterious and anonymous foreign corporations via offshore banking centers, even through respectable financial institutions. It is easy to recognize a laundering operation. Its hallmark is a pronounced lack of selectivity. The money is invested in anything and everything at any price, <laughs> as long as it appears legitimate. Diversification is not sought by these nouveau tycoons, and they have no core investment strategy, no philosophy. They spread their illicit funds among dozens of disparate economic activities, and they show not the slightest interest in the putative yields of their investments, the maturity of their assets, the quality of their newly acquired businesses, their history, a real value, something, nothing, no interest. Never the sedulous, they pay exorbitantly for all manner of prestidigital endeavors. The future prospects and other normal investment criteria are beyond them. All they are after are, is a lapidary mirage. The next group are the investors, and this is the most intriguing group. They're normative, they're law-abiding, they're businessmen who stumbled across methods to secure excessive yields on their capital and are looking to borrow their way into increasing it. By cleverly participating in bond tenders, by devising ingenious option strategies, by arbitraging yields of up to 300% can be collected in the immature emerging markets without the normally associated risks they keep telling us. These are of course all Ponzi schemes, <laughs> pyramid schemes. The members of this subspecies often buy, for example, sovereign bonds and notes at discounts of up to 80% of their face value. Russian obligations could be had for less in August 1998, Nigerian ones in the early 1980s, and Macedonian ones during the Kosovo crisis in 1999. And in cahoots with the issuing country's central bank, they then convert the obligations to local currency at par for 100% of their face value. The difference makes, needless to add, for an immediate and hefty profit. Yet it is 
in often worthless and vicissitudinal local currency. So the latter is hurriedly disposed of at a discount and sold to multinationals with operations in the country of issue, which are in need of local tender. This fuss becomes an almost addictive avocation and an example of such a perpetuum mobile. So intoxicated by this kind of pecuniary nectar, the fortunate, those privy to the secret, try to raise more capital by hunting for financial instruments that they con can convert into cash in Western banks. I don't know, bank guarantee, a promissory note, a confirmed letter of credit, a note or a bond guaranteed by a central bank. All these will do as deposited collateral against which a credit line is established and cash is drawn. The cash is then invested in a new cycle of inebriation to yield fantastic profits. It is easy to identify these so-called investors. They eagerly seek financial instruments from almost any local bank, no matter how suspect. They offer to pay for these coveted documents, bank guarantees, bankers' acceptances, letters of credit, either in cash or by lending to the bank's clients, and this within a month or more from the date of their issuance. They agree to cancel the locally issued financial instruments by offering a counter financial instrument, a safekeeping receipt, contra guarantee, count, counter promissory note, etc. This counter instrument is issued by a very prime world or European bank in which the locally issued financial instruments are deposited as a collateral. The investors invariably confidently claim that the financial instrument issued by the local bank will never be presented or used, which is often true, and that this is a risk-free transaction which is entirely untrue. If they are forced to lend to the bank's clients, they often ignore the quality of the credit takers, the yields, the maturities, and other such considerations which normally tend to interest lenders very much. Whether a financial instrument cancelled by another is still valid, presentable and should be honoured by its issuer is debatable. In some cases it is clearly so. And if something goes horribly and rarely, admittedly, wrong with these transactions, the local bank tends to suffer too. It all boils down to a terrible hunger, the kinds of unslaked thirst that can be quelled only by the denominated liquidity of lucre. It's insatiable. In the post-nuclear landscape of, this, of these parts of the world, a, a fantasy is shared by both predators and prey. And so there is a tendency to believe in unearthly returns owing to some imperfection in the market that can be leveraged and exploited. Circling each other in marble temples, they switch their roles in dizzying progression, these people. Tycoons and politicians, industrialists and bureaucrats, all vie for the attention of mammon. The shifting coalitions of well-groomed men in backstabbed suits, a hallucinatory carousel of avarice and guile, these are common, common um, views. But every circus folds and every lunar park is destined to shut down. The dying music, the frozen accounts of the deceived, the bankrupt banks or exchanges, the Jurassic Park of skeletal industrial beasts, these are all muted testimonies to a wild age of mutual assured destruction and self-deceit that characterize this fourth class of narcissists and psychopaths who call themselves investors, money managers, hedge fund managers, and financial advisors. <laughs>